CBS Laboratories, which later became called the, it became the uh, CBS Technology Center, was started in around 1936 when a Hungarian scientist named Peter Goldmark, who was one of our fellows of our society eventually, um, uh, came. He was, he was a Hungarian educated in Vienna, uh, came and convinced uh, Chairman Paley of CBS that he needed uh, a research, technical research activity because of the new things coming along, especially television. And so uh, Peter started a laboratory at the CBS headquarters in New York. By 1958, the lab had grown, and uh, Peter was given the option of expanding into a new facility in Stamford, Connecticut. And that was what we think of as the CBS laboratories, because at that point, from 1958 on, it was an, a division of CBS. And having division status, it also had a profit and loss responsibility. Contract R&D was our main business. We did some for CBS, but we, it was the height of the space program, and uh, CBS Labs flourished uh, in many kinds of communications activities, everything from uh, uh, designing space uh, voice recorders for the Gemini space flights. Uh, we had airborne reconnaissance uh, video processing stuff. We had communications for underwater swimmers. Uh, and uh, and so forth. I, I might just back up a little bit uh, because I jumped from thir 1936 to 58. Um, uh, but in between that time, of course, there was a Second World War and the CBS activities were discontinued while people scattered uh, various directions for the war effort. But uh, as soon as they reconvened after the war, uh, there are a couple of major developments that came out of that facility. Uh, one was the LP record. Uh, which Peter Goldmark and Bill Bachman are credited with the developing. And the other was the uh, first uh, color television system that the FCC had approved for uh, service in the United States. It did not uh, uh, last. It was that uh, uh, rotating wheel, the color field sequential system, which eventually found application in medical and other uses that required that demanded that high resolution competency. But um, anyway, now we're back to 1958 and contract R&D and so forth. <clears throat> well, the lab flourished, and the idea of making, doing R&D for profit got to be more and more difficult as the government uh, cut back on some of its sponsorship of uh, R&D. And so in, I think it was 1976, there was a reorganization. Uh, the name was changed to the CBS Technology Center, and at that point, uh, we became an expense to CBS, not a profit-making venture. Uh, our activities were limited at that point only to working only on projects that the uh, various operating divisions of CBS funded. Now, it was an interesting time, however, because CBS was a multi-divisional business at, at that point. Uh, obviously, we had radio and television broadcasting activities, but uh, Columbia Records, eventually called CBS Records, uh, was an important client of ours. We were the largest manufacturer of musical instruments in the country at the time, having such brands as Steinway pianos and Fender guitars and Lion and Healy harps and a whole list of things. So all of these divisions uh, of CBS, uh, or groups as some of them were called, uh, contributed to our budget and uh, we did some important work for them. Certainly in our audio uh, end of the R&D program, Quad was very important, and Ben Bauer, uh, who we uh, affectionately called the Quad Father <laughs> at the time, uh, was a prime mover there. Uh, ben had, um, and some executives from CBS Records, uh, witnessed a demonstration by Peter uh, Scheiber, who had uh, uh, shown the industry uh, how a matrixed audio system could be uh, encoded in a disc. And uh, Ben Bauer went uh, back to the, uh, his slide roll a few days later and showed how that Scheiber's technology could be uh, used to make a, a better stereo disc, one which had greater compatibility with the ordinary stereo record. And um, Ben became an evangelist for the system that he called SQ, and it stood for Stereo Quad. Quad never made it in spite of the, the big investment, and people have often wondered why. Uh, and at the time, we heard all sorts of excuses. Well, we, we had too many systems, and people got confused. Uh, 
there was that extremely sexist comment that the housewives or their interior decorators would never tolerate four loudspeakers in the living room. There was concern that the uh, producers never really learned how to use the system. They always perceived it as a four-corner loudspeaker arrangement and, um, and tried to put the listener in the center of the activity rather than not necessarily in the center of, a, of an acoustic space. But I have my own theory as to why okay. Quiet failed. Um, it failed because the record companies could not figure out how to make additional income from it. Uh, and I think the CBS experience probably illustrates it as good as any. That was at a time when ordinary stereo records were selling for six dollars a piece. And a uh, decision was made, since this quad is something special, uh, let's charge seven dollars a record for it. And so the business began that way and uh, every week, every month, you could track the sales, rising sales curves of the uh, of the SQ record at seven dollars a piece. It wasn't that impressive, but at least you knew what was happening. And that extra dollar of uh, on the sales price uh, seemed to cover the cost, the added production costs of uh, editing and, and, and post-production for, for a quadraphonic product. But it was creating problems in the dealer networks. Uh, multiple inventory was always a serious problem and the dealers had you know they had to stock the s standard stereo 12-inch LP they had to stock tape products either reel-to-reel -reel or cassettes and uh, that and uh, comes along another product that needs shelf space and there was a lot of resistance to it <coughs> and there was some resistance to the dollar added price so CBS Records decided to um, drop the dual thing and have every release either be ordinary stereo or, or SQ at the at $6 price. But when that happened, they lost the ability to track, <laughs> track it commercially. It was just lumped in with all product. And pretty soon all they could visualize was that it was somehow some records cost a lot more to produce and they weren't <laughs> there was no increased income from them so uh, so it was dropped and I would imagine that other companies had similar experiences when we first got into perceptual encoding in the digital world we applied extremely high standards of quality to the consumer product I mean we've always had it at the professional end but we had uh, we had the MPEG one layer two which seemed to be almost transparent. Uh, and then along came uh, layer three, and it was pretty clear to most of us that it wasn't of the adequate quality. But the fact is, it was good enough, and today MP3 uh, is the dominant encoding system. Now, there will be others, you know, I, and the MPEG numbers continue to <laughs> rise. I think we're up to an eight, number eight now. Uh, but. Um, we need to remind ourselves that uh, there's something that uh, is equally important uh, than the absolute perfect quality. And that is uh, that the marketplace will accept something which is good enough if it has other uh, desirable attributes. And we, we have to be open and not blind ourselves to what these other attributes might be. We need to assure that the quality certainly is good enough and that uh, that seems to our standards have been rising consistently on that. But good enough uh, probably has leveled off in my my opinion uh, where whereby some of the uh, esoteric improvements that we we enjoy as audio engineers and golden ears <coughs> are really of not much interest to the general public. And unless it comes to them free without an added price tag or the, the need to uh, obsolete their libraries at home and, and buy new hardware, um, we're going to have trouble selling those things. <coughs> now, if we can use them within the industry for our mastering activities and so forth, that's, that's fine. But um, uh, we need to be realistic about things which we present to the public. <laughs>